I'm going to talk about accessibility and the user's perspective in component tests, and I'm going to talk a little bit just about component testing in Cypress itself. Um, so this accessibility stuff ties in somewhat to what Lachlan spoke about with the find by role and the um, sort of accessibility focused part of component testing there. So we're checking the DOM. And it's also going to kind of connect with something Murat's going to talk about later with React testing library, which is a very accessibility focused mindset towards testing React components. But before we get into this, I'll actually, I'll go to this slide first and come back to that agenda. And component testing is now mature in Cypress. It is in a kind of general availability state, um, and it took a lot of work to get here. So I wanted to take uh, time in, in my little slot to just reflect on the history of component testing at Cypress. I've been here about two years. My job is I'm a senior engineer on the component testing team, and I joined um, after the alpha release and before the beta release. So on this chart here, I joined in the middle of 2021 or really towards the end of it. And it was actually this alpha release of component testing that got me aware of how it works in Cyprus. Um, I was working at a fleet management company as a front end development team lead there. And we had all kinds of stuff we were doing for testing. We had Cypress, we had Storybook, we had just kind of view test utils tests for our components. So we were working on um, various different places where we would mount a component and render it and then think about how it works in isolation. And then, of course, we would have the application itself where things would live. And the hardest part for me in this whole process was that mental context switch between the just view test utils tests, where I would have to think about framework specific stuff like vm.next tick or await flush promises, like you do things to simulate the passage of time. You're working in a simulated browser. So there's like a shift in your mind between Cypress writing an end to end test where I work on just the experience that the user has with the fully developed application. And then a component spec where I'm thinking about a lot of the internal details of a component. And so when I had the chance to work with component specs in Cypress, I just jumped at it and I talked to my team and I said, would you like to try this instead of this terminal based workflow with test utils? Would you like to try Cypress component testing, even though it's in the alpha? Um, we loved it. It made a big difference to our workflow. It made a, a lot of things simpler, especially onboarding new developers. And that was 2021. So before all of that, there was this experimental release in 2020. Before all of that, there was a bunch of other work spiking into different packages and thinking about how concepts of component testing in the browser would work. And then today we have component testing as a sibling to end-to-end -end testing in Cypress. 10.0 brought the new UI that puts them side by side. And all the time we're working more on integrating and like improving component testing now that it's out. I wanted to give a couple of specific shout outs. Um, there are people who are not currently on the Cypress team who did a bunch of the foundational work for component testing in Cypress. And it's really important to acknowledge that like the vision provided by Gleb, Dimitri, and Jess together provided the path towards releasing component testing in the browser in the form that we have it in Cypress today. Um, and it's like something I'm really thrilled with the results of. So I wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that um, when we have an event like this, kind of our first you know, long component testing community event. So now let me back up a second and get to the meat of the thing that we're going to talk about here in this session. So we've done this history of component testing, and now we're going to talk about what is web accessibility? Why do we care about it? Why would we want to write tests that assert accessibility? And we'll talk about code as communication. So this is the underlying principle for me of why accessibility is important. Um, we'll get into more detail about end-to-end -end versus component testing. This was also requested in advance by several people in the questions that, in the form that a lot of you filled out. So this helps us think about not just what is accessibility coverage, but where should we put that? Um, and then finally, our exercise to kind of put some of this into practice is just to look at some failing tests, um, just some very simple ones, and fix them in a way that is accessibility-minded, and maybe talk about what we get when we do that. So what we didn't discuss yet, um, my background before Cyprus, I spent a long time working in, uh, in the field of disability support. So I worked directly with developmentally disabled adults uh, for about seven years. 
and I worked in job coaching, job development. So I was helping people find jobs, get trained on jobs, do everything they needed to do for work. And that means you're seeing people interact with technology. And when you spend time with disabled folks who are using software, you become aware of how much the quality of that software influences their independence. And by that, I mean whether you have to ask somebody for help or not. So if I were to define web accessibility, I might use this definition that is different to what you've seen before. It's not really about criteria and you know audits and stuff like that. It's about creating work on the web that disabled people can fully and independently experience. So if you have to listen to something being described to you through a screen reader software. You might listen to Gmail being described and you learn, well, what are, where's the send button? Where's the button to like open these emails? How do I forward things? Gmail is able to expose all these features to you through your browser and through your own assistive technology so that you can privately and independently check your email. If you produce an email client that is not accessible, what that creates for the person who's using it is an experience where I am not actually able to privately check my email because I need someone else to help to click through the interface for me because it doesn't provide the affordances that I need. And when I think about that, I think about the person at the other side of the conversation that we have when we're creating front ends, that helps me figure out out of all of the things we could care about in front end, what code should I write? What's the right code to write for a design that I'm building out? So to me, this is all about the person-to-person -person communication between a front-end developer and, an ex and a disabled user. And this happens through the accessibility tree, which is something the browser makes that we're going to get into because everything that we talk about with accessibility and testing is what information are we putting in here that can get to the user through the browser's accessibility features. If you haven't seen it before, this is what it looks like. We'll actually explore one in a minute, but basically the browser makes this from your HTML. If you're a front-end developer and you ship a page that has the, you know, the, the DOM, the browser is able to derive an accessibility tree out of the DOM. And that means we're creating a structure that's based on it, but it alters things in a certain way. And the most important thing the accessibility tree does is it standardizes all of the different elements and roles and things you might be using to achieve something on the front end. It standardizes them into a single API. And then all kinds of assistive technology can hook into this accessibility API without having to be accommodated specifically in your code. So when I think about accessibility, Almost all the time, I'm not thinking about a particular kind of screen reader or a braille display that you might use to like translate things into a moving braille printer that people can experience with their hands. And there's sip and puff machines. There are all these devices, voice control that hook into this standardized API. And if we get that right, then the browser serves that up correctly and the, the user can experience it correctly through their own technology. And we are most of the time not having to uh, descend into the weeds about specific screen readers and specific technologies users might be using. At the bottom here, we can see some containers. We can see that there's a toolbar with buttons. There's a separator. There's just like information about what kind of content is on the page. What can I do? What are the labels of the buttons? What do these things mean? And all of that is what we need for accessibility. In this slide at the top, we can see, uh, I'd say a very unhelpful accessibility tree. This is what happens if you write a front end where everything is divs and spans. Those are intentionally generic, meaningless elements. So when we create a front end that uses divs and spans, what you receive as a screen reader user or assistive technology user is just generic information about content kind of in a row. We don't know what kind of content it is. We don't know what it means. As we go down to the middle, we can see, okay, someone used the article element for this particular tree. And inside of the article, we have at the bottom, headings, paragraphs, lists. All of these things are just the standard HTML elements that you know, H1, H2, P tags, the UL, and the LI tags that go beneath it. But that provides really powerful tooling for someone who's listening to the page. 
you can ask your screen reader software to listen to all the headings so that I can skim what's the content. Do I even want to read the content? If I'm listening to the page and a list is announced, I can find out how long is the list? How many items does it have? Do I actually want to go through all the way to the end of it? So all of these behaviors come for free when we're using the correct HTML for the nature and structure of our content. I have Google Slides open because we're doing this talk. So I thought I would use this as an example of a complex accessibility tree and what you get from it. One of the things that we talked about is that, okay, Google or yeah, the, the accessibility tree is not, is not the DOM, right? We can see there's a lot of code here. And if I come over, these are divs. I'll make it all a little bit bigger. In the dev tools here, yeah, we can see in this DOM, okay, we have these divs here. But Chrome actually has an accessibility tab where we can enable this full page accessibility tree that happened like within the last year or so, and it's it's new. So if you go to this tab in your dev tools, you can see that it's the last tab and it's a checkbox in here. And what that does for us is it turns on this button and this will translate the entire website, everything that is happening in the page into the accessible semantics that were calculated based on the DOM. So if we look in here and all we see is generic, 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 we know that maybe this website is not very useful for assistive technology and it's not very accessible. On the other hand, if you look at this and you see something like what you would describe over the phone, you can say, oh yeah, there's a button here and it has this label. And we say there's a button for last edit, there's a button for you know, um, joining a call, start the slideshow. So Google has done a good job creating an accessibility tree that makes sense here um, out of the DOM. And they've used a lot of custom stuff to do it. So this ARIA role here, menu item, there's disabled, has pop-up. These are specifically accessibility focused attributes on these elements, which produce this result in the accessibility tree. You can check any website, your own website, something else, Wikipedia, the New York Times. These are pretty good ones to look at. Um, and then try to take a look at like a restaurant menu and you will see a radical difference in semantics and meaning between the accessibility tree you get from a large organization who is like uh, considering the value of accessibility and a local organization like a restaurant who's just trying to get the menu up there and has not thought about this particular detail yet. So now we've kind of talked about how accessibility works. We write HTML on the front end that produces a certain accessibility tree, and this feeds into our overall um, accessibility kind of experience. When we zoom back out a little bit, we talk about end-to-end -end testing versus component testing. So Lachlan's example had some find by role and some, some accessibility focused stuff, real specific about what each component contained. And this is how I would think of component tests as well. The first thing is a component test always uses side.mount. We mount a component and we render it into the otherwise empty HTML page. Per test, we're usually loading up a single component. It's okay if it has children. It's okay if it's a component that we created just to wrap several other components and mount them. And the thing that keeps me focused in component test writing is to think of them as vertical. We are going to go through and check everything that a component does. We have a tiny slice of our application and we're examining it under a microscope. Very much we care about the outcome here. Um, we test user facing and developer facing behavior. So we don't want to test internal behavior, but we want to test something like prop names, right? We're going to use props anyway to set up our component. We're going to pass in children of certain kinds and we're testing that those things are stable but we're also testing the user facing behavior. It is super common to have component tests open during development. And what I would optimize for in component tests is to be specific about the correct output of the component, which is usually you know, sort of analogous to a, a unit test. You would say, call this function and, and you know, it should have a certain response, a return value. In component tests, that return value is the DOM that the component renders. And I really want to confirm there that this particular slice of my application is behaving correctly. In the end-to-end -end tests, we use sci.visit. We go to an actual URL and we look at a running website or application. I think of these as horizontal. We are going through a journey and we're not spending too much time drilling down into the landscape around that journey. 
because that leads to very confusing test coverage. We're not sure if we're testing, okay, user goes here, 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 and did they get to the right endpoint? Or, or are we testing everything about every page and every substate along the way? So I like to have component tests be really specific about the DOM. And my end-to-end -end tests, I like to be a little bit less specific, a little bit more loose in how we hold the application. We'll show that in a second. We want to talk about the steps a user is supposed to take and what's the outcome, especially like could the, did the cart work correctly in our shopping app? Can we log in? Can we use contact forms? End-to-end -end tests, because as Lachlan said, tend to be written by developers and maybe QA engineers and maybe product people, depending on the context. They may have less familiarity with the meaning of the HTML than a front-end developer, so there might be less opportunity to specify the accessible behavior in those tests because those people working on them don't know as much about accessibility. And that very much depends on the person and the organization, but there's certainly more variance in who writes an end-to-end -end test. Um, they mostly run in CI, so feedback is slower, which means if you're going to tell me about the error that relates to the DOM and say, oh, you have the wrong element here, it's it's not a button anymore, you've made it into a span. Well, that's actually really useful feedback while I'm working on the component. I would rather get that feedback while I'm developing a particular component to know that it was actually specified to be a certain element for a certain reason than to write an end-to-end -end test that runs in CI and like 15 minutes after I, I'm done working and I push my changes, I get a failure that says you've missed this particular part of the DOM. Um, so it's really a good idea to have component tests be specific. And then for the end-to-end -end tests, I want to optimize for stability. This is where I use data sci attributes or data test attributes to make sure my end-to-end -end tests are really resilient to other changes that might happen. Um, and they're not re-specifying things we already covered in component testing. Let's talk about why we want to focus on accessibility at all. 20% of people have some form of a disability. This is a figure that you can find some people who say 40, some people who say 10. This is just a loose kind of guideline that there is a non-zero, relatively high number of people with some form of disability. Often that includes you know, mobility issues or blindness, things like that, but also uh, invisible disabilities, uh, developmental or mental disabilities, like things that are, um, you know, broadly conceived. But we want our apps to work for everybody. And to me, like I said, this is the heart of quality on the front end. Um, if you want to find out how to do something, what's the right way to do something? The answer is the accessible way. And what's the right way to test something? The answer is to hold the application the way that our users do especially when we're writing the component tests, which means we're going to use the accessibility features, use the labels, use the text that is part of our components as how we locate elements and how we act on them so that we care about these things and our tests will fail when those things are not met. Um, and it gives me like a really good gut check of, oh, it's hard to write a test for this because my item that I want to select is really just an SVG icon. It has no label. So when I read my test, it's like, okay, go sci.get SVG. But like, what does that mean? Why am I choosing that as the thing to click to make something else happen? If our code is accessible, our tests are so much more readable because we understand the actual human facing label of all of the things we interact with. I also think of our apps and sometimes entire companies as being very complicated, expensive machines that produce HTML. We make web apps, we make websites. What we ship to users is markup that they turn into the DOM on their browser. And so when I think of it that way, I think this accessible correctness, right? This truth about the HTML is actually really important to the quality of our overall work that we did all the way back to servers and databases and APIs and everything that comes through into the front end and becomes what you receive as a user. It's important that we're sending you something that works for you. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that we have a return on investment, the ROI at the bottom here. We can maximize that by being accessible because then everybody who wants to use our product can do so. And uh, that's more customers. So we wanna be able to be available to all possible customers. And in many industries, accessibility is a legal requirement. If your company is a certain size or you receive government funding that varies on the country, it varies on a lot of things. Uh, but sometimes there are legal reasons that you want to make your apps accessible as well. 
The image that I use for this is if people remember when Netflix got started and you would order DVDs in the mail and you could get stuff arriving to you. And it sort of matters that the machine of Netflix, that the machine that determines what you're going to do and posts things for you is going to ship you stuff that makes sense. Um, so you want this unbreakable DVD that arrives in the mail to actually work. And if we're creating code that does not account for accessibility, uh, many of the people receiving that code who aren't using a mouse, who aren't using the browser to look at it directly, who are using assistive technology, they're going to receive a broken experience. And they're not going to be able to complete their task that they wanted to complete. They're not going to be able to become customers. So shipping quality code that works for everybody with their technology is like really valuable and important to me. We talked a little bit about this one already, why we would use component testing as the focus. Um, it's the fastest way to get feedback. These are lower level tests that can find problems very quickly while they're doing local development. The engineer writing the component is supposed to know about what HTML they're choosing and why. So it's very useful to specify that at the same time as you're writing your component. My favorite part is a single source of truth for accessibility. Um, Having coverage that comes from end-to-end -end test, like an end-to-end -end test is called login and it accidentally is like it's checking the footer link and it's checking a few other things because we're on a certain page, but really it's focused on the journey. It's so confusing to me if the coverage of accessibility is spread out in this way, because maybe a certain user journey is not relevant anymore. So you delete that journey, but now you've deleted part of your accessibility tests because it was all kind of mingled together. Um, if it's in the component test, it's super clear what is being tested, what's expected, and you always know where to look for what's the correct DOM output of a certain component in your front-end component system. And finally, in our um, testing pyramid, as we go higher and higher, we go up above unit tests and we are in component land. We don't know as much about those like units. We go up to integration and end-to-end -end testing. We're able to specify less and less about the application and more about the abstraction at the layer that we're at. So I, I don't mind data, data side, data test selectors, those things for stability at a higher level if we've already specified things at a lower level. Let's get into some code. Um, this is a, a relatively short presentation and I don't wanna to spend too much time in the weeds, but I think it's worth looking at a couple of component tests. Lachlan showed us uh, the debug page earlier. So in this debug page, we actually have like lots of failures from the last time I recorded a run here. And we can see like, okay, there's a bunch of things happening. I'm gonna take a look at one of them. Make this a little bigger. So this button test is failing. So our login component test and login uses a couple of other things. It uses an input field and it uses this login button. This test is failing because we can't get the button. So evidently inside of our test, we've specified that there should be a button here. And the first thing I would do if this thing came out in my list of tests to debug is I would open up the DOM. I'd be like, okay, why is get button failing? Make this a little bigger again. We come through and I would look at this button. So as we kind of mentioned, Cypress is, is based in the browser, right? So we're finding the button we think the test is looking for and it's a div. So it has like some button-like behavior. I don't know if you can see, like when I hover, right? We have this little outline that appears when I hover. And so it looks like it's working as a button. And there's some Tailwind classes in here that are defining the hover styles and behavior, but we can't actually find it. And there is a reason that we care about this. So if we come through this spec again and let it run, we can see that it's failing here on this failing test. So like what's the internal component that's using this? I'm gonna know that it's the button component. So we'll skip like exploring to find that. But yeah, okay, the side button component's not working great either. So let's take a look at why this is failing. And we can come in here and we can say, okay, cool. We specify a button element. This is our spec file. We've been able to click through from Cypress. We can say contains button and we'll say this should be visible. I like a should be visible assertion. I use them a lot because it engages the browser's CSS rendering engine. Like it makes sure that your test pass through the browser's CSS and the browser CSS didn't render in a way that makes something invisible. So just contains or just get will confirm it's in the DOM. That's very useful. But I sprinkle a lot of visibility assertions around everywhere as well. 
So this test is failing. Let's just make it be only this test. And we'll click through to the button itself. And we can see that it's a div. OK, cool. This is failing again. Uh, so we'll change this to be a button element. Key thing to notice here is when we save that spec file, or we save this component file, Cypress component testing is rerunning automatically based on knowing the source file that's related and watching that and clicking. And so now we can see, oh, this rendered a bit differently. And it's got a different like style of the hand now over it. So it's doing some stuff that browsers do with buttons. And I'm going to un uncomment this, right? Or un un kind of isolate this test and let the second one run as well. Second one's testing some click behavior. And this is interesting. We're typing the space bar, we're typing the enter key, and we're saying the click handler should be called three times. And that's all behavior that we get for free with the button element from the browser. So the browser handles the accessibility of a button. You can tab to it with your tab key. You can press enter, you can press space. Everything is kind of taken care of there. Within this login form test, we should be able to also see some stuff starting to pass now. So this is where we had been failing before, but now this is passing because it's a real button element. So the part of this that finds the button is passing. Anything else that's going later on that's going to also use this button is going to pass now. We're also able to submit the form and stuff like that in this test. And so the way this form works is by the button being clicked actually submits the form through the browser and that's what gets our data into the login. And so if we take a quick look at the login form component first, we can see that button type submit is what the button is doing. And then we have a submit handler on the form itself. So the behavior in here relies on the button emitting a click. And to me, when we did look at this button test, this one here that does the click and then the type and then the enter, this is all like superfluous, really. If we know that it's a button, and we know that we're not doing anything to interfere with the accessibility of a button. We know that enter and spacebar are going to do the right thing. We know it's going to submit a form. We know these things are going to happen for free without JavaScript to re-implement them. So using the correct semantic HTML, I would usually not bother testing this except in some rare situations because we're testing the browser's ability for a button to behave correctly, um, which I don't really think we need to do. There is this one test I want to take a look at here before we move on. This is a test that's similar to the, like the find by role or find by label text from testing library. We're going to say, give me the label that has password, find the input that's in there. This is communicating to users that this, if you're listening to this be announced, it's an input element. And this password type is also communicating the code in the accessibility tree to users. And then we're doing this browser CSS check to just be like, OK, you rendered in a real browser. Did this thing actually show up? So these are the types of things that we can specify for critical workflows like logging in. It's really important that your password field doesn't accidentally lose an attribute and become a plain text field where people can see type passwords being typed. So we did that sort of work in our component tests, highly specific, highly vertical. I want to switch over to end-to-end -to -end testing. And let's make a new end-to-end -end test. Some of you may already be familiar with Cypress Studio. That's what I'm going to use here. So I'm going to make a whole new spec from the Cypress UI. We'll call it hello.sci.ts. So we're running this. This generated a spec for us that just like goes to the example kitchen sink project. So I don't really care about, about that. Let's make a new test. And we're going to go to where I have this application running, this little login page that we've been looking at. This is here. Paste this in as the beginning of visiting our test. And let's just do some stuff. And we'll click the login button. And we'll get this error here. So I'm just going to say this should have tests. All right, we've done this process. We've typed in an invalid set of things. So we'll save this command. Test name, login, error. So Studio is an experimental feature of Cypress. It's actually been around for multiple years at this point um, and just has a few things that are like not ready for GA. So this is still there. If you want to find out about it, you can use it. Um, but what I wanted to use it for was to show 
that like a test generated with minimal knowledge about the underlying structure. This test is not testing accessibility in the traditional sense of saying, oh, this element should be here, but it's still testing it in the functional sense of I should be able to type this in here. I should be able to type hello into the password field, and then I should be able to click something. And after that, okay, this, this is something I would improve, right? I don't really like relying on this particular thing, but maybe it's relevant for you for an error message to be a certain shade of red. And we would say it should say bad username or password. So Cypress Studio with no knowledge of like your testing strategy or your priorities does know when you use a data sci or a data test attribute. So we can record a test that is very resilient and very generic as long as developers keep these attributes around. And this is a pretty safe test to write from an end-to-end -end perspective. All right, so let's uh, let's wrap up this section. Thank you for sticking with that. I've mentioned a little bit like of the two things we looked at, we looked at a contains and we looked at uh, a data sci attribute. The thing I would avoid the most is long complex CSS selectors like nth child or whatever. Those are very, very fragile when the DOM changes and a user would never care about this failure. If you change the DOM structure and a user wouldn't care, your test should not fail. So as much as possible, we'll try to have sci.contains or, um, or, or data attributes, yeah. Okay, so we got ahead of ourselves. We already recorded that test, so that's good. And we talked about having a generic, um, not semantic selector like data sci or data test to help you target specific things without re-specifying the accessible behavior every single time. I think this is a useful rule of thumb. It is not what you would wanna do everywhere. And finally, no one can tell you your perfect balance here. You're going to be able to write code that is accessible and tested are accessible, but like your business needs dictate how much you want to do that. I am personally comfortable with every test going red if it's not accessible. I care a lot about this because of my background and because of certain companies I've worked at. I'm very happy for any test to fail for accessibility in CI and make it a big problem. But I care most that one test will fail. I care most if we have a component test, I need something to go red if I've had a regression in accessibility. So that's what I'm thinking about the most. I'm not trying to make every front end test accessible. I just need to have a minimum of one. I think that is a good starting target. Takeaways from this section of the talk, accessibility is all about the independence of our users. Component tests provide a clear source of truth about accessibility and you get feedback really quickly. And accessibility works the same way in every framework. So everything we looked at, React, Vue, Angular, Svelte, Lit, whatever you have on deck for your framework, we're able to do that with accessibility in mind. All we did that would be different is the mounting process, but all of this is DOM user-focused stuff. And then finally, this lets the browser do the heavy lifting. So this is advocating for development with accessibility in mind for your actual product development, your actual work, but then also to make your tests easier um, and generally have your tests represent something your user would care about more. Um, all right, so thank you very much. And I know we're gonna have some questions, so I will uh, switch to question time. Um, here is that resources list again, which has links to other, like our blog and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, let's open it up for any questions that we got. And actually, yeah, someone has kindly listed these out for me. So I'm gonna take a look at these here and see what I can answer. And I have about four minutes, so I don't think we'll get to all these right away. Does it make sense, is the first question I have, does it make sense to integrate component tests without having the front end developers be part of this directly? Currently, we have a specific testing team that covers end to end, and I have not understood if it would make sense to cover component tests as well after the developer fixes or finishes a component. So I'll stop sharing at this point and just look at the questions. That's a good question, right? Should non-engineers write component tests? If you're a separate QA team and you're writing end to end testing, I think there is a case to be made that there's a certain pattern of work where this applies. And I have learned of component testing and unit testing even being done by quality engineers where they sort of embed with the team and they work on those things as requirements are being defined. They're using that quality mindset to think about questions and things that they might want to know more about, um, breaking things, you know, that, that mindset of exploratory testing during development. And so if you're able to write component tests that propose scenarios that haven't been considered yet um, during development, that's one way to do it. 
The other reason that you might want to do it if you have engineers who are writing tests in one team and are capable of coming over to write component tests is kind of like I said, it gives you a good source of truth for where component specs uh, should live, what they document, and it helps to um, give feedback faster to the engineers. So the massive advantage you have with Cypress is that your component specs and your end-to-end -end specs use exactly the same syntax. I'm sure a lot of people on this call are new to component testing. All of the DOM focused stuff is exactly the same. So even if your engineers can just mount the component and like get it into the certain states, I think there is some value in certain cases. Um, I would not necessarily think that every organization will work that way. Okay, there is a great question here from somebody who is working at a climate tech nonprofit startup making real change in the fight against climate change. I love Cyprus, but I rarely get time to master it, meaning I stick to the basics. Would a Cyprus rep be open to helping us make the most of your amazing tool? Yes, we have comfort, we have a kind of contact information in the slide at the end of this. You can reach out to us on Discord. Um, I don't know exactly how we do that type of work, but I know that we would love to have that conversation. I think uh, that climate change stuff is really interesting. So let's see here. I will just take a look at one more question. Okay, cool. And this follows up from the earlier one. In the case that we have QA engineers writing these tests separately for the developers, should it become at least partially the responsibility of those writing the tests to hold the developers to good standards of accessible web design, or should this be handled at the organization level? This is a great question, and it's a lot deeper than it seems because ultimately caring about this is an organization level thing. Like a lot of things about testing and quality, you want to have management buy-in before you invest too heavily in it because it can be hard to explain why we're spending time on accessibility. So it has to kind of roll itself into your testing strategy. Yeah. Um, so you certainly need the team on board, but in terms of like how you hold uh, folks accountable to good standards, um, it very much depends upon how your organization works and what the gates are for quality. So. Um, yeah, at this point, I will I will move on, and I'm going to hand it over 